Hello everyone and welcome to today's Connect and Learn webinar. Today's webinar is part of a series of 10 Connect and Learn web webinars designed to support um, new alcohol and other drug clinician throughout regional, regional and metropolitan Victoria. It's hosted by Turning Point and funded by Department of Health and Human Services. Our topic for the today is identify and respond to domestic and family violence in the alcohol and other drug sector. My name is Phoebe Spry Bailey. I'm one of the Education and Training Office at Turning Point, and I will be facilitating today's webinar. Before we continue, though, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land upon which we are presenting today, and on which you, as the participants, are located, and pay our respects to elders, past, present, and emerging. Before we get started, I just um, we'd like our webinars to be as interactive as, as possible. So throughout the webinar, you will get the opportunity to respond to a couple of online polls, and we encourage and welcome questions from the audience. Um, we'll have a halfway through the webinar presentation, we'll have a um, time for our presenter Sheridan to answer questions, and then we'll also um, at the end open up the questions again. And you can make questions, you ask questions or make comments via the chat box at the bottom left hand corner of your screen. And one thing I want to let you know is a copy of the PowerPoint slides is located in the documents folder which is on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And in there there's also some other um, handouts that Sheridan will be referring to throughout the um, webinar. And if you have any technical problems, Red Back are here to help you out. So um, again, just you know, um, write in the chat box or please call the number on the screen. Okay, so let's move on to um, tell you a little bit about our presenter for today, Sheridan Byrne. So Sheridan has worked for 10 years in the family violence sector within refuge and crisis services. She's worked with victim survivors and delivered family violence training to the community and the alcohol and drug sector. Uh, she has recently joined the workforce development team at Turning Point and we're delighted to have her working with us because she's extending her expertise knowledge into the AOD sector. Um, this webinar, it was originally advertised that um, Dr. Carrie Alexander would be joining us today too, but due to um, heavy work commitments, she's unable to make it today, but she does send her apologies and you know, Kerry is a strong advocate for prioritising the welfare and safety of victims of family violence um, at all times. So Sheridan will be presenting information today and she will also be answering your live questions. So please, we, you know, we do encourage questions. And it's, you know, it's great to have you all with us today and I think it's going to be a really interesting webinar. So now I'm going to hand over to Sheridan. Thank you so much, Phoebe. That was a, a beautiful, warm welcome, and I'm really happy to be here doing uh, this live webinar with you, and very happy to be a part of the Turning Point team. So, as Phoebe said, I've come from working in the family violence sector, and so um, have been delivering training. I've worked previously in crisis and direct service delivery, but I've also trained in the community sector broadly. So, I've worked with people in alcohol and other drugs to train them up in doing risk assessing and how to identify and respond to family violence. So this is a really fun way to continue to develop everyone's skills and, and keep that conversation going about how we can work with our clients and make sure that people are safe. So before we begin, I wanted to um, just say a quick word about self-care. So even though today I won't be showing images of abuse or describing graphic violence or abuse, it wouldn't be uncommon if you felt something because of the content of this webinar. So if you, you know, before we begin, just take a moment to consider the ways that you might self-care if you felt impacted uh, or felt strong emotion because of the, the topic that we're talking about today. I just strongly encourage you to, to consider the things that you do that you know uh, kind of reconnect you to yourself, um, you know, when you, when you do feel, you know, either triggered or just just emotionally impacted. So I wanted to begin with language. Some people say that the terminology uh, used around domestic and family violence and the different words gets them feeling a little bit confused and things do change from time to time. So if that's you, you're in fine company. The words, the language that people use has chi uh, changed slightly. So in the state of Victoria, the term most used is family violence. Uh, and it's what you'll see within legislation within Victoria. 
The term family violence, it lends itself more readily to family-like relationships of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, and it includes non-domestic relationships and kinship relationships. So today you'll hear me say family violence, but I might also use it interchangeably with domestic violence. But if the people you're working with refer to the term you know, domestic abuse or intimate partner violence, uh, this is also correct. It's mo mostly important that you should use the language that makes sense to them. The other terminology that I'll be using today is how victims are referred to. So here in Victoria, we typically use the term victim survivor and you'll sometimes see it with a dash between the word victim uh, and survivor or sometimes uh, a, a, back, a backslash, I think it's called. Um, and so this really denotes that when someone is experiencing family violence, then someone is a victim of a crime. However, what distinguishes family violence from other forms of abuse and violence is that it's not a one-off event. It occurs in a protracted and pervasive nature, usually over long periods of time and typically with a build up and escalation. And so victims are drawing on resilience and resistance when they're experiencing this crime. So using this term survivor acknowledges this and, and using the term victim survivor allows us to hold both things as true. Okay, so before we begin, we're, begin, we're gonna have a quick poll uh, and the poll, I believe, will come up on your screen. So the first thing uh, I'd like to, we'll do a couple of these throughout this webinar, which I think is really fun. So I want to hear from you, how much of your work involves family violence? And we'll just give you a minute or so to, to have a response there. So, so far, most people, oh yeah, so we've got either uh, the majority of my work involves family violence on some level, or my clients are dealing with AOD, not family violence, or I wouldn't know because they don't tell me. I'll just give you another. So if you wanted to put in a response, we'll just give you another, another 10 seconds. All right, so we might just stop there. So 57% of people said the majority of their work involves family violence on some level, uh, and 42% of people saying my clients are dealing with AOD, not family violence. So the majority of people are saying, yes, the majority of my work involves family violence on some level. So thank you so much for that. That was, that was really uh, interesting. So what we know is that you know our, the clients we work with, none of us are dealing, we, do, we don't live in a single issue world, so we know the people that we work with are also experiencing multiple issues, all simultaneously, and, and things link in together. So um, it's really important for us to remember that there are a lot of things going on for the people that we're, that we're, that we're trying to serve. So we know that a significant proportion of family violence perpetrators and victim survivors use uh, and you know at certain points may abuse substances as well. And so while substance use isn't a cause of family violence, alcohol is involved in up to half of partner violence incidences in Australia. And three quarter of physical assaults on partners um, also turn into, in, turn into physical assault. So when there's threats of violence, um, and then alcohol is in the mix, then those threats will uh, statistically are shown that they will escalate to, to actual physical violence. So the ABS reported two thirds of domestic violence incidences involving alcohol resulted in victims sustaining long term injuries uh, and also injuries were more frequent and serious when alcohol was involved compared to domestic violence incidences when alcohol was uh, absent. And the presence of alcohol and other drugs within uh, common risk assessment, or what's known as the CRAF, uh, is seen as one of the red flags. And we're going to talk about that in a little while as well. Uh, so victim survivors may also be coerced into substance use by perpetrators. Uh, and they also may be using substances to cope with the impacts of the violence. That we know that that's really common as well. So I suppose the reason I brought this up and I just wanted to kind of poll this and get you to think about it is that your work within the AOD sector is highly impactful and in Victoria's 10 year plan to end family violence, your work is really, really important here. 
I also wanted to kind of point out that within the Royal Commission um, that the alcohol and other drugs sector was, was highlighted in a couple of the recommendations. So if you're not familiar, I'd encourage you to have a look at the report. The Commission was established uh, in the wake of a series of family violence related deaths in Victoria, and most notably the death of 11-year-old Luke Batty, who was killed by his father in 2014 after years of abusive behaviour directed towards Luke's mother, Rosie Batty. So since then there have been other family violence related deaths and the establishment of the Royal Commission is an acknowledgement of the seriousness with which the Victorian community has come to regard family violence and the consequences for individuals uh, and their families. So it reflects on a growing awareness of the scale and a recognition that existing policy responses have been insufficient to reduce the, pre the, the prevalence and the severity of the violence and the priority that the community is prepared to accord it in, in order to address this problem. Um, and so also that the, in 2015 the UN pledged to work towards the ending of all forms of violence and discrimination against, uh, against women. Um, and so you know, Victoria has taken up um, this as well. Um, and so you can see one of the recommendations there, recommend, recommendation number 99 is an increased collaboration between mental health, drug and alcohol and family violence services to promote a shared casework approach for ease of referral and risk assessment between agencies. So we are all in this together. There is a, a, you know, a lot of change coming and we are needing to work across sectors to work together to make sure that um, the people we, we support get the best responses. So we need to be looking out for and identifying family violence and making sure that we provide a, a really good response. So it's my hope that at the end of this presentation you'll feel an increased sense of confidence in your ability to identify and to respond to family violence and also to be able to have some meaningful conversations with your clients and also to the referring agencies that you, you, know, you may now have increased referral capacity to, you know, within, so within family violence uh, and other sectors as well. Uh, and that you might also be able to talk more uh, easily and more confidently about the risks uh, and also about safety as well with your clients. So let's have a discussion now about uh, what is family violence so that it, you know, we can start to increase your ability to identify it when, when you see it. So domestic and family violence is defined as a pattern of behaviours used by one person to obtain and have power and control over another person. So I've got uh, an image up here on this slide which is the Duluth Power and Control Wheel and this, this was created in I think 1984 um, by the Duluth uh, Domestic Abuse uh, Project in Minnesota and there's a, a link there. While we haven't provided a link, I have provided the URL there on the bottom of the screen. So you could go into that link and there's all different wheels that are, um, you know, that you can download and they're in different languages and, and uh, different ones that might be more appropriate for the clients that you work with. Um, but this is really, even though it was created in around 84, it's still really, really relevant. And although this wheel doesn't show all of the different forms of abuse that fit under the category of, of um, domestic and family violence, these really are the most common and most prevailing. So um, this can be really, really helpful. So what you can see in the slide is this image and it describes some of the most common tactics that perpetrators use to obtain and maintain, uh, maintain power and control over their victims. Um, and so, for instance, if I just draw on one of those there, you can see uh, coercion and threats is, is uh, said to be one of the forms of um, power and control. It's, it's interesting or, or probably helpful to think about these, not just sort of sitting out on their own, but also think about the fact that it is somebody using them. So we would say um, that a tactic by a perpetrator or a user of violence is the use of coercion and threats uh, and the use of intimidation and the use of emotional abuse. What you also notice on the wheel there is that you've got power and control sits in the centre. On the outside of the wheel, you've got physical violence and sexual violence. So the image is, uh, is drawn in this way to remind us that even while physical and sexual violence might not be being used by a perpetrator, if any of those other kind of tactics are being used by a perpetrator, there's always the threat of the physical and sexual violence uh, present 
even while there isn't any, you know, even if somebody isn't making those threats or isn't actually being physically abusive, that if somebody is controlling you, then uh, the, the, there is the presence of that looming kind of threat that the, this could escalate to physical. So that's why the wheel is drawn a little bit like that and it helps to remind us that that's what victim survivors experience. The other way to understand family violence is to understand the legislation in, in your state. So here in Victoria, we have a, a piece of legislation. Um, and I might just move to that slide now. Yep, there it is. So it's called the Family Violence Protection Act and it was updated in 2008. So uh, here in the Act and it was updated in 2008. So uh, here in Victoria, that means that the, um, we define family violence as behaviour by a person towards a family member or that person if the behaviour is if physically or sexually abusive or is emotionally or psychologically abusive or is economically abusive or is threatening or is coercive or in any way or in any other way controls or dominates the family member and causes that family member to feel fear for the safety or well-being of that family member or another person or behaviour by a person that causes a child to hear or witness or otherwise be exposed to the effects of behaviour referred to in paragraph A. So children are particularly vulnerable uh, and the exposure of family violence can have an ongoing and uh, ongoing developmental impacts and really lifelong repercussions for them. So that was one of the um, clauses that was added when the uh, Act was updated in 2008. So what you will notice within that legislation, and I do want to say it can be really helpful if you do read that. Many people know that that piece of legislation exists, but they've never read it. So I'd encourage you to really read it and really know that it backs you. So if you're trying to trying to ascertain if there's somebody that's working with you, and if you know if you would say, mm, I think I'm identifying family violence is going on for for my client, you know, go back to the legislation. It really does help to support us when we're when we're trying to identify and kind of analyse what what it is we're really seeing. And you'll notice that within the legislation that it helps us distinguish family violence from other forms of violence and abuse. Um, you know that it, it speaks about these words fear and it talks about tactics related to control and coercion um, and I just wanted to point to um, a researcher in the United States Evan Stark so Professor Evan Stark says learning that violence is not always visible and that it takes the form of coercive control is a very important issue so many times victim survivors don't get the kind of responses that are really appropriate or really helpful for them because people will think that the violence is only physical and if they don't see evidence of that, then they'll dismiss it. So it's just something to remember when you're working with your clients. So tactics by one person that would physically hurt, degrade and intimidate with things like threats and surveillance acts, we would say are, are acts of coercion, which is, is in the legislation, isolating victims, regulating them by setting strict rules of behaviour that they have to adhere to, they're considered control tactics. Um, and so, you know, those things you'll see within the lived experiences of your clients. And if they're there, then you can you can probably make an assessment that this is somebody who's experiencing somebody else holding power and control over them. So the legislation um, classifies family violence as occurring within intimate partner and or family relationships. So just to clarify that those people experiencing intimidation and abuse from neighbours or colleagues or other people within the community, that would fall under a different legislation and have a very different, they'd have a very different experience of their abuser uh, and the abuse itself. So just to kind of clarify that. The other thing noted in the preamble of the legislation is the prevalence. So while anyone can be a victim or a perpetrator of family violence, and family violence is seen across all socioeconomic groups within our communities, family violence is overwhelmingly perpetrated by men against women and children. So in a breakdown of the, uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics Personal Safety Survey data of 2017, which you can have a look at online if you'd like, women were more likely to experience violence from a known male, usually a partner or an ex-partner, and it's usually in their home, whereas men were more likely to experience violence by a stranger in a public setting and as a one-off incident. So you can hear that the ways that um, different genders were experiencing uh, violence actually lends itself to family violence and intimate partner violence being more experienced by, by women. 
So according to the 2017 National Homicide Monitoring Program report by the Australian Institute of Criminology, on average one woman a week is murdered by her current or her former partner in Australia. So we know that gender plays a really big part in, in this crime. Uh, and I've just lost the screen, but that's okay. So the other things that we want to be um, aware of as well is that diversity and intersectionality uh, are things to be aware of. And so there's certain groups that are at elevated risk as well and hold specific vulnerabilities because they hold specific vulnerabilities in our community. So um, just to name a few, and obviously you know we could probably create a whole webinar on, on this topic uh, on, it, on its own, but Aboriginal women, uh, because of things like um, uh, racism and colonisation, the history of colonisation, will experience family violence and intimate partner violence uh, in very specific ways as well. And, and what we know is that Aboriginal women in, this, in, this, um, uh, in Australia are you know, more likely to be hospitalised when there's physical violence. So they, they are experiencing specific vulnerabilities. Women with disability as well, um, uh, very uh, have specific vulnerabilities as well. Um, and uh, around 70% of women with disabilities will have experienced family violence and intimate partner violence. The LGBTIQA plus communities, there is still research going on right now, but also you know we know because of uh, homophobia and a lot of the, the kind of um, the tactics available to perpetrators to shame and out, use outing and those kinds of tactics mean that they also have specific vulnerabilities and culturally and, li and linguistically diverse communities as well. So um, those people who may be here on spousal visas um, would have specific vulnerabilities as well. And so we will talk a little bit more about that as well. But the groups of people that you know, that you work with will have specific vulnerabilities. Okay. So I suppose what we want to do is make sure that we you know talk about how you might. So we've talked about the legislation and those things that define and distinguish family violence from other forms of violence and abuse. Those kinds of things that you might be. Uh, you know, listening for in the stories and the presentations and just to kind of say that a lot of times victim survivors are really pathologised as having low self-esteem um, and that sometimes people who are victim survivors, they may minimise the abuse that they're, they're experiencing because they're being threatened by their perpetrator and that's really, really common. Um, but they may also just have lived with this violence for a very long time. That's also really common. So to them, the violence might not you know, might not seem uh, so escalated because of that. So the other thing to know is that people won't disclose to us unless they feel really, really safe. So we need to do that work to make sure that we built the rapport and that we're able to use this language uh, and that we feel comfortable and confident as well. And if we don't feel comfortable and confident, we're better off to get some support to, to talk with people that we think might be victim survivors. So you might be in a position to identify family violence within the lived experiences of your clients. Um, and so many people will have told you know, these people that you know, they might have victim blamed or they might have told them on some level that it's, you know, it's, their, um, it's due to them having low self-esteem or that they're just picking the wrong people. So just be aware that some, some of those kinds of attitudes might be internalised by victim survivors as well. <clears throat> But that a lot of times, you know, what you'll notice is that there's this inability to kind of connect with self. I once worked with a woman in uh, a refuge, 
And on the day she came in, I just offered her a cup of tea and she had no idea how she took her tea. She was so disconnected from her preferences because she'd been living uh, under parent control um, and the domination of her, her partner for so long. So it's just something to consider uh, in the ways that people might present um, to you when they're attending your services. Okay, so identifying family violence when clients attend appointments with you. There are many things you may see that might indicate to you that somebody uh, is experiencing family violence and somebody's holding power and control over them. So I've just put a few on the slides here. So um, first of all, partners might insist on coming into appointments uh, and so you'll see that. So um, that that's very, very common. I, I've heard this a lot from people who, who work in the AOD sector that they have, a, you know, their clients have have a partner who insists on attending. Um, you might notice that the client is distracted by their phone and they state that they must be available to receive calls from their partner or their family member. Their client might take a lot of calls or text messages while they're with you from them. Um, they might state that their partner or family member is waiting outside for them and that they must be finished up by a certain time. And you know maybe that's not unusual, but you may notice that there's a lot of anxiety or fear from this person. There's just a lot of anxiety about the fact that there's somebody waiting for them outside. You might also identify parent control within the stories of your clients. So um, you might hear that their partner stops them from leaving the house or attending their appointments. So you, know, you might hear that the reason they didn't show up last time is because the partner said that they couldn't come. Um, you might hear that the partner makes them feel guilty when they're seeing friends or family, uh, that they're always checking up to see what they're doing and where they're going and ask them to check in with them. You might hear that their partner controls or manages their finances. Maybe they're on an allowance and they have to keep receipts for everything they spend. They insist on looking at their phone records and uh, all their ingoing and outgoing text messages. You might hear that they're putting them down, telling them they're useless, calling them names criticising their ability to make decisions, calling them derogatory names in relation to their drug use. So those kinds of things you know, may stand out to you in the stories of the, of the um, clients that you work with. The other thing, you may also notice patterns within the drug and alcohol use of the people that, that could be an in, of the people that you work with that could be an indicator of the presence of family violence. For example, a client who's in a, maybe an on-again, off-again relationship and then you notice there's a pattern of drug use at certain times when they're in the on-again time of the relationship. Or maybe you'll notice that there's a pattern of abuse that they speak about. Um, there's something that's known as the cycle of violence so that kind of helps us to understand when people are, uh, you, know, you know, people are being kind of kept in this pattern of um, you know, abuse and then make up period, abuse and then make up period. So just listening out for those. So simply letting the person know that you notice could actually indicate to them that you're a safe person to disclose. So you might even just say to them, look, I'm just noticing that, you know, you've made a commitment to yourself uh, and I'm noticing that those times when you kind of, um, you know, when you, when you kind of fall off the wagon or whatever language you, you might use, I'm noticing that you know it seems to be when your partner's moved back in, and I'm just wondering if you know if there's a relationship between those two things, and do you want to talk about that? So there are certain evidence-based risk factors, which, if you hear these within the lived experiences of your clients, they co they correlate highly with the victim being seriously injured or killed. I want to preface this section by saying that. Um, being able to do risk assessing and risk assessments and at the moment the um, best practice risk assessing for family violence is called a CRAF, which is the Common Risk Assessment Framework. Um, is, it takes being trained in CRAF, so I, I'm not able to do that for you today and I would strongly encourage everybody to look to do the CRAF training to be able to assess risk in family violence. But I do just want to let you know that these are the what's called the red flags. So if you did that training or if you've done that training, you'd be familiar with these. I also want to let you know that we're going to provide you with the link to this as well. So you'll be able to download this as a PDF and you can keep this in your workstations and refer to it. But it is on the, um, the website for the Domestic Violence Resource Centre Victoria as well. So they've created this as a resource. So I just wanted to reference them here. So the red flag, so the following behaviours and, and perpetrator tactics are evidence-based risk factors across the world. So uh, controlling behaviours um, is, is one of them. So who, who the person sees, what they do, if they work or not, where they go, 
um, those kinds of things. If you hear that the, the, the uh, partner or family member is controlling your client, you want to listen out for what's really going on there because these, these are, uh, this is definitely a red flag. Stalking. So, I mean, nowadays we'd say it's mostly happening online. Um, uh, but it could also mean that maybe you're hearing that uh, somebody's partner is turning up to appointments maybe that they didn't know they were going to be at. Um, and so you might think maybe they kind of are, are, are you know, using surveillance in some way and, and tracking them. Uh, things like jealous behaviour, so the, perp the perpetrator persistently may accuse them of being unfaithful. You could hear a lot of slap shaming going on as a, you know, as a part of this and they might use the excuses of um, you know, being jealous to further control them. So um, you know, where they go, who they see, what they wear, those kinds of things would fall under that. Um, and you know, like a lot of times, these things slip through because you know, in the in the society that we live in, a lot of the jealous behaviours can sort of be pitched as things that are you know within loving behaviours. So um, it can kind of slide through. But jealousy and you know, using control in, under the guise of jealousy is really something that um, you know, if the person is in family violence, then it's it's a risk factor. If you hear that somebody has been strangled, or even if the partner or um, family member has placed their hands on their throat, this is this is also uh, a red flag. Um, and if they've made threats of doing that, we'd say as well. If they've made threats to kill the person, of course, you you know within your your uh, role, you'd also think that this is you take this seriously, and it is a red flag. If the perpetrator um, had access to weapons. Or if you heard that they were using objects as a weapon, so anything, you know, any household object that was thrown at somebody, we would say, that's, you know, you probably assess that that's somebody using a weapon against your client. Um, the other, the other one as well, I suppose, is if the person uh, talked about the uh, partner threatening to harm the pet, the family pet, or if they had harmed the pet. Um, especially if the pet is either you know, belongs to the victim survivor or the children as well. So you want to listen out and take that really seriously. So these um, kinds of um, circumstances and tactic, uh, tactics by perpetrators correlate highly with being killed or severely injured. There are other, obviously there are things like uh, child abuse as well, which I know you would you'd be responding to anyway if you heard uh, child abuse, but uh, of course, this would also mean if somebody was pregnant, so an unborn, unborn child as well, threats to the unborn child would also um, be a red flag. So there are certain circumstances as well that correlate highly with the uh, victim survivor being killed or seriously injured, one being that the, uh, the person is pregnant um, and the other one being that um, if the perpetrator is using drugs and alcohol as well. So um, here in Turning Point, there are several research papers that are in development around that subject about family violence and the use of drugs and alcohol. So one which is, there's a few that have gone through, but one that I can tell you about that's just uh, gone out for peer review at the moment actually examines the relationship between packaged liquor outlet density and physical violence within intimate partner and family violence. And the preliminary findings suggest that there is a relationship. So that in areas where there were uh, packaged liquor outlets close by, there was actually an increase in the escalation from maybe threats uh, of, of violence to actual physical rates, or the rates of physical violence uh, and the seriousness of that violence. So you can hear within that that there, is, you know, there are links that um, mean that you know, the use of drugs and alcohol um, mean that you know, we need to consider that it's, it's a red flag. So presence of these indicates, uh, the other thing sorry, that, that I did want to mention is the escalation, the escalation uh, of violence. If you hear that it's gone from you know, maybe some verbal to physical, then you would consider this is high risk because you can hear there's escalation within the scenario. And the last one I want to mention is separation. So statistically, the time that women and children have been killed uh, during it is during or within the first three months post separation. So uh, filicide, the, the murder of children, is is highest at separation. So it's a serious issue, and we want to listen out for that in the stories. So controlling behaviours predicts fatality more than the frequency or the severity of physical violence. So, um, you know, and this is what the evidence tells us as well, is that we need to listen out for when, uh, you know, the, the people we work with 
uh, might be experiencing controlling behaviours because there, there is a, a correlation between that and being killed. Uh, and like I just mentioned before, separation correlates highly with the fatality to women and children or what's called um, familicide during and up to three months. But just to say that it can go way beyond that as well. Um, but just statistically, it's that three month mark. Okay, so the ways that we want to respond to, to victim survivors is first of all, uh, always ask about abuse or suspected abuse in private. You never ask about abuse in front of a suspected perpetrator. So this can have the impact of escalating the abuse to the victim survivor. Uh, and you want to also have very clear communication around your limits to your confidentiality so that people know, um, that, you know that they're making informed choice when they disclose to you. So be direct, uh, secondly be direct and specific. So many victims say that they, they would have known that someone was safe to disclose to if they'd asked them a direct question. So try and be as clear and direct as possible. And if you've done the training around suicide prevention, you'll understand that this is, this is similar. We, we need to make sure that people know that we are safe to talk to about this issue. Thirdly, never blame the victim survivor. So even today with a lot of the work that's been done to increase the awareness around domestic and family violence, the narrative that exists is in the community is overwhelmingly still victim blaming. So you need to be, be aware of, of that and also any judgments. Fourth, use open-ended questions where possible. So um, you might say, I noticed how many times your partner's called and how anxious, uh, how anxious it appeared to make you and I'm wondering what would happen if you didn't pick up the call or something like that. So I've just got that in there for you as well. So it's just an open question allowing the person to share their story with you and it really just communicates that you're somebody who is safe to disclose to as well. Uh, fifth, it's really important to remain non-judgmental and this may mean that you have to hold back from giving your opinion or your advice or even criticising the perpetrator. So it's really important you allow the victim survivor to remain at the centre of the conversation. If someone is experiencing another person holding power and control over them, it's really just unhelpful if we come in and start to tell them what to do or make judgments about their situation. More importantly, you want to really encourage them to tell their own story and make their own decisions. So we'll just pause there uh, just to check if there's any questions at this stage. Phoebe, did you? Um, we have got a few questions. Maybe I'll just ask one. Okay. Um, sorry, the question is. Okay, yeah. Or not. I'm, I'm sorry, I've just got a few here. So okay. I'm thinking what might be. I might ask this one because it's. Um, we haven't actually touched on this. Okay, um, what should I do if I'm working with a man who is a victim of family violence is one of the questions. Oh, okay, fantastic. So this does get asked some, sometimes too and it gets confusing. There's sometimes when there can be a misidentification of, of who the perpetrator actually is. Um, and so part of the work with the, so if the person, so you said the person does identify uh, as, as a, a man, as male. So there's something called the Men's Referral Service uh, and they are trained counsellors and it's a really great idea to um, give them that referral because at the Men's Referral Service they, they are trained counsellors but one of the things they'll do when they're speaking to somebody is they will provide uh, like a counselling approach but within that they'll also be is they will provide uh, like a counselling approach, but within that they'll also be assessing to hear who is the primary uh, the primary aggressor in the situation as well. So, if the person you know is identifying as a victim, but maybe they are uh, you know may actually be a perpetrator, they'll be able to work with that in a way that's really you know really supportive and um, that you know they have training in that as well. So in either you know, in either instance, the, the men's referral service, and we'll have that phone number at the end of this as well on the website. So yeah, that, that's a really great service. And I think it's really important to let them know that, uh, let people know that this is a service that, you know, many, many men contact and, you know, we get feedback all the time that it's a really, really good service. Is that all for now? Yeah. Okay, beautiful. So I might move on if that's okay. So let's have a discussion about uh, the per about perpetrators or users of violence, as some people uh, prefer to refer to them as. So if someone is a perpetrator or user of family violence, you might be in a position to identify this within the stories and the lived experiences of, of your clients. 
So you're in a position um, to be told things like, uh, you know, they may reveal to you that they have an existing intervention order um, from an ex-partner. Uh, and so you may you may hear within the stories of what's happening in their lives that they're then making contact with their partners. So if you if if somebody has an intervention order against them and they make contact with that partner, then they're actually breaching the order. So um, and breaching actually becomes a, a criminal offence. So these are kinds of things that you might hear within the stories. And so it's something that there's a discrepancy there if you hear that your client is has an intervention order out against them uh, and then you hear that they've you know made contact with their partner you could you could identify that discrepancy um, you may also uh, be in a position where you observe jealous or controlling behaviors you might hear threats to to kill or harm um, partners or children um, and you may actually have disclosures um, you may just even hear things like, you know, that they've, or they might bring their partner in with them, and you might hear how, how often they blame their partner for their own behaviour and those kinds of things. So we might just pause for a moment to do a quick poll. Uh, and this poll is just asking, what's the what do you think is the best practice response when identifying that your client is a perpetrator or a user of violence? Just interested to, to see what people think. So what's the best practice response when identifying that your client is a perpetrator or a user of violence? Just give you another few seconds. Okay, so we'll, we'll probably cut it off there. That's great. So most people are saying number three is what they believe to be the best practice response. Maintain a non-collusive practice and seek support from your manager or team leader. And this is correct. So you, uh, at this point in time, only special, only certain people are trained within the alcohol and other drug sector to to work with perpetrators. So you really want to find out who that is in your area. So you need to make sure that you've had a conversation with your manager, your team leader, your supervisor in your area. Uh, and you want to maintain uh, a non-collusive uh, engagement with your client um, and then just get support from somebody who, who is trained. Thank you. Thank you for that, for um, participating in that poll. And that's great to see. And obviously people have, have had, a, had a think about this already. The, the thing to know is that victim survivor safety is paramount, paramount when we're engaging with perpetrators. We need to make sure that the, any work that we do uh, is really keeping the safety of uh, the, the victim survivor and of course you know that means children as well. So uh, and that's why you know this response is, is what it is. So it is not your role to, to change or challenge the behaviours of perpetrators. Behaviour change programs are really, really specialised work and they need to occur within an integrated and a coordinated response that's focused on a continual assessment of risk. Um, so currently there is work happening in the AOD sector um, and we will be soon employing family violence advisors that will be in a position to, um, that may be in a position to provide training and may be in a position to provide responses. Um, but you really do need to make sure that you have a have a discussion with people uh, with your supervisors in your area and know who it is that you would refer to and who you would seek support from if you then you know if you did identify that a client of yours was uh, using or perpetrating violence. This word collusion, I do want to say this because some people have said to me that they keep hearing the word collusion and it's starting to have. Uh, not much meaning to them, but it, it's a really accurate word uh, when we're talking about working with perpetrators. So I mean, this, uh, in the context of practice, collusion is defined as any response that encourages the perpetrator's violence supporting narrative. So this includes agreeing with the perpetrator, you know, in, agreeing, agreeing with their perspective, agreeing with, you know, like throwaway statements even, uh, that they might say, agreeing with you know, a negative statement they might make about their partner or family member, 
or even if they've made some sort of statement that is clearly an identification that they are a perpetrator and then you remain silent. We would say that's also being collusive. So it's probably just no better word right now and maintaining a non-collusive practice is really the best response you can have. Perpetrators have a highly uh, reinforced way of minimising, denying or justifying and excusing their behaviour. And many of these, these are really backed by our social norms and practices and the structures of the communities that we live in. So because they happen in intimate partner relating. So perpetrators typically will take a victim stance and then they work at eliciting a sympathetic response from you. So when we're talking about maintaining non collusive practice, we, may, we mean you know, identifying when that's going on and just not joining them there or agreeing with them. So identifying when perpetrators are inviting you to sympathise uh, and, uh, and minimise or, or justifying their behaviour. Uh, anything that might affirm their behaviour or make their abusive behaviour seem neutral. So you want to refer to your manager to coordinate a plan of response. You want to seek support and super supervision for yourself. Uh, and you could also consider uh, getting a secondary consult from Motor Violence. I've provided the phone number here that's actually it's called the admin line into motor violence, but it's the one where if you wanted to get a secondary consult, so it will, uh, if you don't want to actually speak to a counselling service, then, then this is the number to call. And we've included the website there as well. Just important to know that the new information sharing legislation also means that you could be contacted if you, uh, if the person you're working with is a perpetrator, so, and you may need to share some information about the perpetrator um, and that this is all under the new legislation. And this is really only when there's risk to the victim. And so, you know, when that's present, you know, that somebody could call you and ask for information about them. Um, there may be some people who are actually disclosed to you. They may say, look, this is what's been going on and, I, you know, I know that what I'm doing is family violence or I know that I've been, um, you know, abusive towards my intimate partner. So that we would consider that's a, a disclosure. And so if that happens, we would say the best practice response is to um, to, to give them a, response, a referral to men's referral service um, and also to normalise that as well. Let them know, you know, we give this number out all the time, many men use this service, we know that they, you know, they're getting a good response. So um, making sure that you have that number close by is really helpful. So I just wanted to point out there's a couple of places where you might do family violence work. One is in the intake and assessment form. So there are, there are questions around risk and complexity in section two. And also uh, in the comprehensive assessment, you've got the, uh, in section six B, harm to or from others. Like anything um, you know, in, in using these documents, we would always encourage you to use your own language. These are prompts, so don't don't just read straight from the um, from the document. Make sure that you keep a narrative approach and and have conversations with your clients. The other thing is in the comprehensive assessment, there is a section there that's about uh, safety planning. So just to let you know, again, risk assessing for family violence really you should be doing the comprehensive risk assessment framework training. And also that you know the safety planning uh, that could have been you could ask the person if they are already linked with a family violence service they may have done safety planning with them there and you could consider if they haven't linking them in with their local family violence outreach service to talk to them about risk and safety planning. In terms of referrals, first of all, if someone is in immediate danger, so for example, they've said to you their partner's waiting for them outside and they're really scared or it's unsafe for them to go home tonight. Really, the only people who can you know, have legitimate power to provide a safe response is triple zero, the, the um, police, uh, because they can provide a 24-7 response and also because they can attend the home, whereas we can't. Also, Safe Steps is the 24-7 Family Violence Support Service, um, and they provide risk assessing and referrals to refuge. Again, you know, they will do uh, a risk assessment and you could, you know, you could consider if the person was at great risk keeping them with you and um, they could call safe steps while they're with you. Um, also, if the person is safe now but you want to talk to them about maintaining safety, um, you know, start with what they're doing now. Victims of, victim survivors are doing things every day to keep themselves safe. So make sure that you talk to them about what they're doing now and, you know, see if there's any way that you can um, add on for them uh, or provide other kinds of services. 
and um, you know consider what you could do for them while they're in a safe space within your service. The other thing is you could uh, check to see if they've already got referrals to outreach services in their in their um, local region. So across each region, there are family violence outreach services, and I've just put the um, the link up there too. So DVRCV have um, the referral booklet, which gives you all of the state services that are um, that that are the outreach services, but but other services as well. So you can have a look at that. I'd highly encourage you to have a look at that to make sure you know who is your local family violence outreach service. So you can refer to that really easily. You have it at hand. And we've also just provided a few specialist services. Just to know there are more than these, but you have um, family violence services, support services specifically for Aboriginal women um, and uh, also legal services. So this is the um, family violence legal service for Aboriginal um, people and those with Aboriginal children is the JARA. And uh, also, if you work with anybody that is from a culturally and linguistically diverse background, in Touch Multicultural Centre Against Family Violence is a very good service, and especially for things like uh, immigration issues that come up as well. So you can you can give these you know these services out to your clients. For people who are LGBTIQA plus, we have I Heal Recovery Support that provides support and counselling for victims of family violence within the LGBTIQA plus. Um, communities and then there's also now revisioning. Revisioning is a men's behaviour change group for perpetrators or users of violence who are gay, bisexual, or queer men. Um, and so that's that's within Thorn Harbour Health, which was previously known as VAC. And also, I'm just uh, going to leave this link here too. Is the uh, if people are safe but haven't really been provided a family violence response, you might consider letting them know that there are support groups as well. Um, you know that they could look at linking with me when we've got the link there. I would encourage you to look at other kinds of trainings on an ongoing basis and also just to encourage you if you give feedback to us today, if there are things that you would like special, uh, specialised kind of uh, training in around this, you know, the issue of family violence, we might come back later on because there's definitely some changes happening but if there's certain things that you think you'd like to hear about, make sure you pop it in the comments box when you give us the feedback as well. And I've just left a few links here on this slide so that you could look for other kinds of training. DV Alert is a new organisation that provides training. DVRCV uh, provides ongoing training, and then 1800 Respect uh, they provide online trainings as well. Whew. Thank you so much, Sheridan. That was it was amazing because so much valuable information um, delivered in a very short period of time and. Yeah, so thank you because I do realise this is probably training that goes over a day for you on you know, in a normal day. Yeah. So um and you know, it's wonderful to have all those links for further information too. We have just got a few questions. I realise we've only got five minutes, so but um first of all, someone asked a question earlier and I sort of wanted to wait to the end because you I think you've sort of answered this because um the question was because it's so often invisible, is there a set of questions to ask that helps the victim to open up to you, so making them feel safe to answer the question? So I think you talked about open-ended questions. Yeah, um, yeah. Are there any other tips that um, you could provide at this point in time? Uh, I would say look, really allowing the person to be at the centre of the conversation, just identifying the things that you notice. And then also making sure that you you frame it in a way that normalises it as well, and normalises it, but also shares the evidence base. So maybe saying things like, "Look, we, you know, we know it's a common experience when people kind of, you know, having these experiences that they might um, blame themselves, for instance." So any of those things that we know are, are kind of common experiences when people are experiencing family violence, um, just share those as well because it can make the person kind of hear that. They're, they're, first of all, they're not alone, but second of all, that um, that there is that, that you're identifying that as well. That you're identifying that their experience is, is something that is common if they're experiencing family violence. But mostly working from what they're sharing with you. And it, I mean, I think that people in the, in the alcohol and other drug sector are so you know beautifully positioned because of the work that that we do in being able to. Um, just continue to work with people and meet them wherever they are, and I think you're able to do that in, in a really holistic kind of way as well. 
Okay, thanks, Sheridan. Um, and there was another question that was there that was um, around how do you um, how do you facilitate someone to leave safely once mm -hmm. from your you know once you've you know spent time with them so from your service. Meaning physically move out of the service? I think that might be yeah, it. Was a question that was typed there. Uh, okay. So. okay. Uh, I suppose you, what you'd want to do is, I mean, we're always considering safety. So if somebody is talking to you, I might make an assumption that what you're meaning is that maybe they know the perpetrator is outside or maybe the, the perpetrator is at home, those kinds of things, and they're, they're, um, they're, they're physically leaving your, your service. You always think about safety and, and really you're breaking this down. I mean, you're doing, you know, it's, it's kind of that harm kind of minimisation approach um, and, and checking in on breaking it down to, you know, are they safe to leave today? Are they safe to go home? What kinds of, you know, and, and maybe checking in with them. Does any, is there somewhere that is a safe place? Are there safe people in their life? Just make sure that you ask around safety. Like what is what exists right now for them that keeps them safe? What are they doing right now to stay safe? Are there people that they could um, draw on people or certain maybe other services that they're they're linked in with? Check in with what they currently do to keep safe. And then, you know, and sometimes it's really good just to highlight that to people. So saying to somebody, okay, so I'm hearing you've already done this, you've got this in place, you've been doing, you know, you know, you've been keeping you and the kids safe by, you know, doing X, Y, Z. You've got these people, you know, could you maybe make a plan with that safe person to go and spend time with them today? So just really breaking it down and checking that, you know, this, the immediate risks are kind of um, mitigated against and uh, and talk to them about what is their plan for safety. Sometimes they, there are things that they're doing that are really automatic that they don't even realise they're doing uh, as safety precautions. And if we have that conversation, and just really highlight, then we're kind of validating that work they're doing as well. Okay, thanks a lot for that, Sheridan. That's all we've got time for today, question-wise. So um, very soon, I think, Webback's going to be launching a um, feedback survey. So we really appreciate your responses to it. But also, if you have got any um, further questions or ideas for um, uh, if we were to have a part two of this um, webinar, what other information you'd like to know, feel welcome to include that as well. And I just wanted to mention, as I said, Connect and Learn is part of the series. Our next Connect and Learn webinar is on Wednesday the 22nd of August. It's called In Recovery, a Clinical Perspective. It's, going, it's presented by Dr Naomi Crafty, who happens to be our manager at Workforce Development at Turning Point. But she has a particular interest in recovery and she actually co-facilitates a unit on recovery in the Masters of Addictive Behaviour unit as well. So we look forward to that one. So um, yeah, so if you have any questions for Sheridan, feel welcome to email her, which her email address is on the slides. Okay, thank you so much for joining us today and I um, hope you found it useful. We'll see you next time. Bye.